Hill here on News Nation. It has been a staple of the political scene for decades, and tonight we now know it will soon have a new leader. Wayne LaPierre announcing today he is leaving the National Rifle Association in just a matter of days. Coming up, what it means for the NRA and what is being said across the dividing lines. Plus, in Iowa today, Donald Trump set to take the stage momentarily, just 10 days away, don't you know, before the Iowa caucuses. And moments ago, President Biden wrapped up his own speech. That one was at Valley Forge, focused on democracy the day before the anniversary of January 6th. And as you might know, there are brand new Jeffrey Epstein documents released just hours ago. Our team is going through it. We'll tell you what's in them. Here we go. Thanks for being with us here on The Hill once again. I'm Blake Berman, joined today by Chris Steyerwald, News Nation political editor and senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Scott Bolden, former D.C. Democratic Party chairman, Ashley J. Davis, former George W. Bush White House official. Where's our cameras? Where they are? Mark Lauder, <laughs> former press secretary to Vice President Pence, and Mick Mulvaney, former Trump White House chief of staff, News Nation contributor as well. Hello, Mick. The Hill on News Nation starts right now. Happy Friday. Hello to you all and come on in. You know, it is it is a little hard to upstage Donald Trump and the president of the United States all at once, but it might have just happened. It backs the Second Amendment, has more than 4 million active members at any given moment, and is a major force for conservative lawmakers right here in Washington, the National Rifle Association. But in recent years, some have wondered if the NRA has actually been weakened and have speculated what its future might look like. Think of the NRA however you might wish. Your opinion likely has been solidified for years, if not decades. Perhaps the only thing more solid than your opinion of the group has been its leader since 1991, Wayne LaPierre. And tonight, LaPierre, 74 years old, has announced he is leaving the NRA at the end of this month, the end of an era, and perhaps a new one begins. Hello to you all. I thought this was a pretty big announcement. Um, Some folks were wondering if if this was going to happen because, of course, there's a a trial involving uh, him in New York starting on Monday. Chris, this, this change at the NRA, what does it mean? Well, uh, you know, Wayne LaPierre um, so profoundly wrecked uh, the NRA. Uh, There was uh, a big to do a long time ago. You may remember uh, uh, Colonel Oliver North went over to the NRA and they were going to fix things up at the NRA. There's going to be a problem. Uh, But he was defeated. Right. And the uh, reformers who tried to come in at the NRA time and time again were defeated because Wayne LaPierre made it his fiefdom. It belonged to him, and it got way out of its lane in terms of what it was supposed to do and what it was conceived of as doing, and it became a TV network, and it became a lifestyle brand, and it became all of this stuff. And at the center, I think a good way to think about Wayne LaPierre, he would be like the pastor of a church. Mm -hmm. Where it stops being about the message Mm -hmm. and starts being about the pastor. And I think the uh, uh, leaders in Washington can take the the example from Wayne LaPierre, which is if you grip so tightly and dig yourself in so deep, you will hurt the institution and you'll end up leaving anyway. All right. Mick Mulvaney, uh, come on in. Mark, Ashley, uh, three Republicans on this panel. Um, I'm going to send it over to you. Uh, Mick, let's start with you. What, What do you make of it? Chris is absolutely right. In fact, as a former elected official, I can tell you, you know, 15 years ago, it was a big deal to have the NRA get involved in your race. By the time I left Washington, I didn't really care what the NRA was saying because I didn't perceive it anymore as being a a group that was really dedicated to the principles. The group was dedicated to Wayne LaPierre. That's what that's how I perceived it as someone on the outside looking in. So I think Chris is is spot on. There are now competitive groups that have, have uh, jumped up in the last couple of years to try and take the mantle of the Second Amendment away from the NRA. Some of them with some some success. The Gun Owners of America has been a fast-growing, successful group. So yeah, uh, the best thing for the NRA was probably for him to leave. But the the better thing was probably for him to leave three or four or five years ago. Mark Ashley. 
Well, I agree with Mick that he should have probably left three or four years ago when the whole drama and the scandals that were happening around the NRA. I mean, I just I think that I was expecting this to happen and it didn't happen soon enough. So I don't think it's as big of a deal. No. And I think that the brand of the NRA, while it may be tarnished in Washington, D.C., I think amongst many folks out there, gun owners. Yeah, when you get out of the beltway, what is it? I think yeah. the, the brand is still strong. And if you can uh, quickly turn it around under new leadership, I think you can regain some of that political power. It's not going to be easy. But luckily, as we head into an election cycle, I don't think it's going to have any impact uh, on 2024. People know who's for the Second Amendment and okay. who's against it. So uh, every town, which is the group that is a, a staunch, cri- one of the groups that is a staunch critic of the NRA, said this. They said, uh, quote, for years, Wayne LaPierre has pushed an agenda that has cost countless lives, fueled armed extremism and endangered our communities. His legacy will be one of corruption, mismanagement and destruction. The trial begins on Monday. Thoughts and prayers to Ooh, Wayne LaPierre and the NRA. Mean. Scott? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting that he resigned a day before the trial begins. That does not absolve him of accountability. The attorney general for New York has said as much. Uh, and he still has some potential liability in regard to mismanagement of funds and what he spent personally versus for the interests of the NRA. So we'll have to see. What will be even more interesting is the Democrats' reaction to this We'll be looking to see who the new leader will be and how how influential that new leader will be. There's a lot of relationships with LaPierre that are gone now with his resignation. Right. And they've lost about two million members, I think I read. And so, you know, listen, there was a time and place. You know, under him, under LaPierre, we had, there was uh, the Mutzenbaum, Mutzenbaum bill out of Ohio. We had a ban on assault weapons for several years in the late 90s, I think, Chris. Mm -hmm. And um, once the the NRA got past that, uh, he became a force within that organization. So... Uh, but goodbye and good riddance. For <laughs> That's what I was waiting to hear you say. <laughs> Speaking of forces, uh, live look right now. Do we have the picture? I think we might. Uh, Sioux Center, Iowa, uh, the first of four events. Uh, Sioux City, right? Yeah. Uh, first of four events that Donald Trump will attend in the Hawkeye State over the next two days. And where he's expected to talk about Republicans' view as a two-tiered justice system. Now, last hour, President Biden traveled to historic Valley Forge where George Washington fought during the Revolutionary War. War. The president is using tomorrow's anniversary of January 6th to argue the fate of the nation's democracy is what's at stake here in the upcoming election. Here is what he had to say just a little while ago. Watch. Talks about the blood of America is being poisoned. Echoing the same exact language used in Nazi Germany. He proudly posts on social media the words that best describe his 2024 campaign, quote, revenge, quote, power, and quote, dictatorship. In a social media post today, Trump says, quote, crooked Joe is a threat to democracy. They are setting a horrible precedent for the future of our country. All right, I know it's not the general, Chris, but um, it's starting to look like it, and they're talking about two different, but in their view, I guess, similar things. So, uh, third anniversary of January 6th, uh, and you have a, a recent po- a poll out from the Washington Post yeah. and University of Maryland. What do Americans think, right? What do Americans think about January 6th? Should, should it be uh, always remembered, or is too much being made of it? There's a reason Joe Biden is doing what he's doing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is it's not close, right? It's a 10, 15 point gap on these questions about where Americans fall on January 6th and they take it seriously. And I think very significantly for Trump, 24% of Republicans say that it's a big deal and that it's important, right? Okay. And we'll go ahead. I'm moving my computer. I'm sorry. And I don't mean to cut you off. Um, and, and Mick, I want you I to come we have in. breaking news. Yeah, no, we do, we do, we do. Uh, the Supreme Court on Friday, agreed to consider whether former President Donald Trump could be deemed ineligible to run for office again because of his actions leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. This is uh, the Associated Press, I believe, reporting. The brief order said the case would be argued on February 8th. Wow. Wow. I'll put the computer back and open it up. Nick? A long time. Yeah, listen, I got a a question for, 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 for Scott and my Democrat friends. Look, if you really believe that Trump is Hitler and you really believe that MAGA is Nazi, how do you go back from that when he wins? What, what, do, you, what, what do you do from that? I mean, because that's really, really dangerous to me. That bothers me, that if you really believe that, 
that are you going to vote to certify the election? Are you going to deem him to be not your president if he wins? Are you going to be undermining democracy and, and think that's okay because the end justifies the means to get rid of Hitler and the next, uh, next wave of Nazism? This language really, really frightens me because I think it has the tendency or the, at least the risk to undermine democracy as much as the Democrats say that Trump is doing it. And I'm, I'm frightened to death by the language that Biden used today. Well, I got to tell you, it's in response to very dangerous language from Donald Trump. Donald Trump's language is everything Joe Biden said, and democracy is on the line. Well, regardless of what the polling says, January 6th was real. I think there's a feeling that somehow that our democracy cannot be tested and won't be tested. But democracies get tested all the time. <coughs> and based on Donald Trump's language, and based on his rhetoric, right, the reality is he's going to implement everything he says. And he does use but language what if he wins, that mimics yeah. Nazi Germany. <laughs> Do we what ignore if he that wins? and just forget about it? No, no, you well, don't. But what if he wins? Is he illegitimate? Well, he wins, is he, is he, is he Hitler? We lose a lot. We lose a lot by him by him winning. But we can't take the chance of not reminding the voters in this country of what his democracy looks like, which is a <coughs> dictatorship or even anarchy. That's real. We are at risk. And they're going to juxtapose Donald Trump with Joe Biden. And what's your choice going to be? Do you want anarchy and a dictatorship based on his words? Yeah. Or do you want democracy with someone that you don't like I, I, because I get, he's aged? Well, yeah, no, I, I, I get all that. I guess my question is, <laughs> is that what if more than half of the country doesn't believe you? What if more than half the country says, you know what, I hear what you're saying, Joe Biden, but I still want this guy instead of you, so I'm going to vote for this guy for president. Do the Democrats not accept the outcome of that election because he's such a bad person? That's what worries okay, me. Okay, hold on. I, I want to I ju oh, jump in here, and, and I want to get Mark. No, okay. I want to jump in, and I want to get Mark Ashley and Chris okay. on that banner. Supreme Court will review Colorado ballot decision. February 8th. I cut you off. No, well, the, 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 break, the break, this is very significant. Uh, this is big breaking news. Uh, so we are, we will have been just in New Hampshire. When that, when that, yeah. when that happens, when those, those arguments are made, uh, we will have just been in New Hampshire. Uh, Iowa will be in the rearview mirror, and we will be uh, basically three weeks away from the South Carolina primary. Now, I don't expect, and I, I'm not going to tr get into your lane on this, mm -hmm. I don't expect that the Supreme Court is going to disqualify Donald Trump from appearing on the ballot. I, I don't believe that they will. But those high-profile hearings talking about the events of January 6th and reinforcing Trump's role in trying to steal a second term and all of that stuff, that is not helpful timing for Trump. Now, look, I think Republicans stick with him. The, the more Trump is under attack... The more that he and the more that he appears uh, to be a victim, then the more uh, hardcore supporters come to him. But boy, that is not that is not good time. But the thing this actually feeds into what our original uh, of this topic was, was threats to democracy. I mean, you actually have Joe Biden standing up there saying threats to democracy while Democrats are arguing that a political candidate should be taken off the ballot. While Democrats are saying Democratic candidates can't even appear on a primary ballot. You don't get a choice to who you vote for. You get to vote who the D.C. swamp tells you to vote for. And that's what this entire argument's about. So it actually reinforces while Joe Biden says one thing, he's doing the exact opposite. It's not a defense of democracy. It's destruction of democracy. So you're, so you're in. Do, no, I, well, go ahead. No, I go, just go. want to do the timing because you'll know this better than me. So they'd hear the arguments on the 8th. And then how long will it take? Because obviously they usually they're not going to be. Well, it won't be immediate. Uh, normally, but weeks. A, a, a week. If they do an emergency yeah, it'll decision, be it'll be at, it'll le be at least a week, within a week. Sometimes you get it in three or four days, but that would be rare. Yeah. When, Bush, when you Bush when you have a pressing it, yeah, Bush v. Gore. Yeah, well, when you have a, a when you have a pressing yeah. issue, uh, we'll get to do the thing where, and maybe who knows which of our colleagues will get to be out there doing it uh, <laughs> as the down runners, down as, as, as like the that. young, nimble people come sprinting out of the building with the papers to hand them uh, to our Isn't reporters. Isn't that how Abrams like made it? I mean, you got to be good. You got to you got to have speed. Like, you're, you're, in, you're in Nikki Haley's orbit. You're in her world. I, I wonder what your take is on this when this just, you know. Well, I was thinking view. about this today more in regards to what Biden's saying about Trump on it. 
His supporters are going to be stronger for him because of what of January 6th and some of these attacks and what's happening with the Supreme Court. What's all- happening? Mm-hmm. No, let me just finish. Mm-hmm. But I also think that it does help. I think for those people that are on the you know that 20 yep. percent that hasn't really made a decision that it again, which is her message, not mine, but the chaos that follows Trump is going to continue for the next two. And the other thing I would also add, too, is take a look at the decision. And I agree with you, Chris. I think the Supreme Court will throw this out. But if it's a 6-3 decision along partisan lines, watch the so-called defenders of democracy immediately attack the Supreme Court. Mick, hang around. Lots of news here coming up here on The Hill. The Hill on News Nation. Back in a few on the other side of the break. Stay with us. All right. So continuing with this breaking news, of course, uh, now we know that Donald Trump, the Supreme Court, is going to be taking up the case uh, as it relates to whether or not the president of the United States, the former president, who is currently the Republican frontrunner, can be kicked off the ballot in a state to try to get back his his old job. February 8th, Supreme Court taking up. I'm re- taking it up then. Uh, I'm, I'm reading the, the brief here. I probably should hand the computer to you, Scott. Like, <laughs> the, but it says, uh, you know, it sounds like motions need to be filed by, by January 18th. Um, and then there are a few other dates in here. But bottom line is they're going to take it up on February 8th. Mick Mulvaney, come on back. Um, your, your thoughts as we now learn uh, that the Supreme Court is going to take up this, this Colorado ballot decision here in a few weeks. Yeah, we've talked about this a little bit uh, before on the show, and there's going to be an opportunity, I think, for the Supreme Court to to maybe bring the country together a little bit. If they were to rule 9-0 in Trump's favor on the ballot access and essentially say, look, the 14th Amendment was never meant, the language doesn't speak to the president, so it's not a due process question, it's just you can't kick a president off because of the 14th Amendment. If that's 9-0... And then at the same time, or about the same time, they rule 9-0 against him on all of his immunity claims. Again, he's got a similar Mm. case going up to the Supreme Court where he says he can't be sued for anything while he was president. They could look at that on a on a on a on a unanimous basis and say, no, that's that's crazy. That's that's not right. So it's a nine zero decision for him on one, nine zero against him on another. That might actually calm things down a little bit. I know that's not how the Supreme Court looks at it, but if, if that's the decision, that might be very healthy for the country. Would that would that satisfy you? That well, it would. Let's it, make a deal. I, think, let's, let's make a deal. <laughs> I mean, Mick and I agree on very little, but I agree with him on those two outcomes. Those are plausible outcomes. It, it won't be based on politics. It will be based on their conservative decision making and how they look at it. And those those nine zero against the nine zero four, that's quite plausible given the circumstances of both of those issues. What about on this specific case? I know Mick brought up the possibility, and, and maybe it is a possibility of them ruling 9-0 on both. But, yeah. but on this one, if they were to rule 9-0, 8-1, and it is store shut, do, do you think that would bring the country together? Uh, I, Democrats don't, no. gonna- I, don't, I don't think it would bring the country together because it would, it would continue to raise the question of Donald Trump's conduct and the enforceability of that provision. I think, this is what I think. I think if their state rights as justices, they're big on Actually, that. He's taking a Gorsuch, deep breath. No, Gorsuch <laughs> has ruled on something like this already from uh, his home circuit. Um, then um, you're going to have these, you, you're going to have them kick it back. They could kick it back to the states. They're okay. strict constructionists. And I don't think having them on ballots on some states and not on others is that chaotic. I really don't. You just manage it because states control elections. Right, states, right. Federal well, and state elections. You think that, so if you were a Supreme Court justice, you would vote no. Oh, I don't know how I would vote because I don't have all the briefings so, and neither How much they. better looking would the robes so Scott, be? The robes would be a lot Scott, though, better well, looking. As a criminal defense attorney. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we don't need you anymore because now as soon as a police officer just arrests you or accuses you of a crime, you're guilty and you are punished no, you by have, the government. Because according to this, mm-hmm. Donald Trump is removed for insurrection, which he's not charged with. He he's not been be convicted with. with. Nobody in January 6th has been charged this with. Is and we are just declaring by fiat No, he is guilty and removed. Moved from office. This is why you need a criminal defense attorney. Okay, follow me closely. That provision does not require a conviction. It requires Congress. It, it does not require Congress either. It does not require a conviction. There have been findings of facts. 
and determinations of law by two state, one state agency and one a state judge. And because you've had those findings, you're right. There are no, uh, there are no strictures. There are no way, there's no methodology for enforcement, but that's the natural process. And you have that already. So he doesn't have to be convicted and he doesn't have to have an enforceability process for the to, 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 um, to have the 14th Amendment live. Section. Because if you, if you follow your Mark, thought quick. process, you, you're just going to ignore Section 3? I'm going go to I'm gonna go, to section, I'm gonna go to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which says okay. Congress has the power by legislation to enforce this provision. Ra- yeah, wrap this up. Take us home. Doing anything. The, uh, in, Sonia Sotomayor uh, on the Democratic side. So right now, John Roberts, the chief justice of these United States, is thinking, how do I get Sonia Sotomayor to vote against removing Donald Trump from the ballot? Mm -hmm. And then how do I get Clarence Thomas or Sam Alito, one of the farthest right justices, to vote against uh, granting Trump immunity? I think Mick Mulvaney has cut the Gordian Mm. knot here, Mm -hmm. which is that there are two difficult questions facing the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Roberts treasures and and values the reputation of the Supreme Court so much, and it's been under assault lately. If they can come up with a way to give everybody a black eye, right? So if they can come out of this and say, you don't get what you want and you don't get what you want, then we've got something. So Sonia Sotomayor will be getting flowers, I think, from the (laughs) Chief Justice (laughs) this evening. The second second case has no date. So, I mean, there's going to be a long time between... Yeah, we'll see how it all... Would you say... You're not suggesting there'd be horse trading uh, that would (laughs) go on... Absolutely not. Never. The Supreme Court could never rule that Donald Trump or any president is above the law. They could never rule that. And so that's why he's going to lose on that one. All right. Um, By the way, there's uh, the Iowa caucuses in 10 days. We haven't even gotten to that yet. (laughs) What's going on there? What's going on in New Hampshire? (laughs) This is going to laugh. On the other side of the break, Steyrwalt is going to break it all down. And then when you think about the panel here, Ashley Davis, uh, Haley World, Mark, you're tapped into Trump. Mick, tapped into Trump World. What are they all hearing as we head into one of the biggest weeks in politics? That is coming up on the day chock full of news, my goodness. <laughs> the hell back in a few. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Right side of your screen, Sioux Center, Iowa. One of the reasons why we're showing you that. Donald Trump expected to be speaking live. We're hearing maybe in about 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, if and when that happens, we will listen in to see if the former president says anything about the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, that says on February 8th they will take up the case regarding the state of Colorado and former President Trump. In the meantime, though, and why he's there in Iowa just over a week from now uh, in the Hawkeye State, voters there will battle the cold weather to to get to their caucus sites where they will will deliver the first results of the 2024 election. But some candidates are already looking past Iowa. Steyerwalt is here to break it all down. Chris... You know, I looked at the weather today in Iowa for next weekend so that I can start packing to go. You know what the forecast for a week from today is? Okay. Two, low of 2, high of 12, snow. Iowa. So you'll get to see me looking at you <laughs> through the, just that. There'll be the, only that much sticky. Only my eyeballs will get frostbitten. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's cold in New Hampshire, too, but getting warmer for Nikki Haley. Here's what Nikki Haley had to say about uh, the difference between the two states. You know how to do this. You know Iowa starts it. You know that you correct it. You know that you continue to go. That is not what you say if you're leading in Iowa, by the way. Uh, Iowa, you correct Iowa's mistake. Um, And that is a reflection of reality for Nikki Haley, who has not quite been able to get around Ron DeSantis into a clean second place in Iowa. But... Things are good for her right now. Look at her fourth quarter fundraising haul. Uh, This is uh, a a quintuple, uh, quadruple what she had raised before. uh, And this reflects the uh, chips moving in on her for that quarter of the Republican Party that we talked about before uh, that doesn't want Donald Trump, right? So for that minority in the Republican Party that doesn't want Donald Trump, That money is a reflection of the support, and she's doing it in New Hampshire. She's getting ready in New Hampshire. But you know who's taking it seriously? Donald Trump. Look at that guy. Just 
so happy. Uh, he is not that worried about Ron DeSantis in Iowa, where he in the most recent Des Moines Register poll leads by 32 points. But he is taking Nikki Haley seriously. That's $1 million in Iowa compared to $4 million in New Hampshire, uh, or as my kids call it, New Hampshire. Now, look, how about this? Why don't you look at this instead of me looking at my papers? She has a problem. And that problem is Chris Christie. Chris Christie, and this is the uh, intrepid Caleb Parker uh, flagged this statistic for me, and I love it. Chris Christie's spending in New Hampshire is almost double that of Ron DeSantis's spending in Iowa. Now, Ron DeSantis is out of gas, right? So he's, he's, he's limping into the finish line. But Chris Christie outspending in New Hampshire Ron DeSantis in Iowa. Why is that important? Because Chris Christie is killing Nikki Haley. He is absolutely killing Nikki Haley. Uh, Trump is up running ads against her. Uh, he's, he's swinging in. And here is the here are the numbers in uh, in New Hampshire. Look at these most recent decent numbers. There's a lot of bogus numbers out there. Here's the most recent <laughs> decent numbers out of New Hampshire. And that 12 percent for Chris Christie would be enough to get her right inside the margin of error with Donald Trump. There are no Christie Trump voters, right? There's nobody that would not vote for Chris Christie who's going to vote for Donald Trump. Those are Nikki Haley voters if Chris Christie's out of the race. So he is spending money. Trump's hitting her. She's taking it from all sides. These are the 15 days, two weeks that will make all the difference for Nikki Haley. This is her moment. Hmm. There you go. Styrewalt breaks it down. In my long johns. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Don't you think, um, I mean, I don't know if it's going to make a difference or not, but Chris is going to continue. Chris Christie is going to continue to get the pressure to get out if she comes in a decent second place, I bet, in Iowa. So the, the fluidity in the Iowa electorate is real, right? Donald Trump swung basically... The, the swing between Donald Trump and Ted Cruz in Iowa last time was net-net 12, 13 points, mm-hmm. right, compared to what the polls were showing going into it and Cruz's performance. Trump underperformed, Cruz overperformed. Mm-hmm. Um, Trump is up 32 points in the most recent Des Moines Register poll. He has to be thinking in Iowa about what's the expectations game. Donald Trump says that he can shoot thunderbolts out of his eyeballs <laughs> and that he's running away with it. And, and we, he, he, always prone to exaggeration, the former president uh, keeps saying his lead is bigger. I'm leading by 60 points. I'm leading by all the points. I lead by a billion points. Uh, People are saying it's the biggest lead in history. So he is bringing those expectations into Iowa. If he underperforms those numbers substantially, so uh, uh, I don't think Donald Trump's going to lose in Iowa. But if Donald Trump only got 39 percent or 40 percent compared to getting 60 percent support in Iowa, that opens the door. But that's pressure on DeSantis, Mm -hmm. right? Christie is all in. Christie is just like... Hanging on for New Hampshire. He just wants to, to have his moment in New Hampshire. But if DeSantis it, uh, disappoints or Nikki Haley somehow gets ahead of him in Iowa, then Ronnie D is back to Tallahassee. Okay, around, yeah, the, around the table we go real quick, and, and I'll start with you with, uh, with Mick. Um, Mick, you talk to more people than anyone I know. What are you hearing? Uh, a lot of what Chris said. The, the, the key number is going to be the Donald Trump top line in Iowa. If it's above 50, then I think there's probably not that much pressure on Chris Christie to get out. There'll be some, but not a much. If, if he comes in at 42 in Iowa, the pressure will ratchet up tremendously on Chris Christie. The other thing we haven't talked about here are the other voters who are with folks like Vivek Ramaswamy. Most of those are Trump voters. Uh, a lot of DeSantis voters are That's probably true. Trump voters. So yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of attention on Chris Christie dropping out of the race. But if those folks drop out after Iowa, what does that do to New Hampshire? Lauder, what are you hearing? Biggest victory in Iowa has been 12 points in a contested non, you know, incumbent race. Uh, he's gonna, he's gonna exceed that, set a new record. And I think the biggest number problem for Nikki Haley is not New Hampshire or Chris Christie. It's what follows getting beat by 30 points in your home state. The only thing Nikki Haley and any of these candidates need to be thinking right now is soft landing. Stick the landing in the Olympic terms (laughs) because this thing's coming in. Where are you going to be on the train or are you gonna get left behind? Ashley, what are you hearing real quick? What train? The Trump train. Oh, oh I, 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 I want to I I I hear from you. What, what? No, I, I think that she feels like she's in the best spot that she could be in. Six months ago, no one thought that she would, we would be talking about her as the candidate to beat or that Trump was spending money against her or DeSantis. Was, you know, she's DeSantis, everyone thought he was maybe going to beat Trump, and he's not even when, anywhere around. When Trump, when Trump won, when Obama won, 
when Bill Clinton won. Unexpected things do happen, right? These unexpected things do happen. And it's very hard for our linear brains to accept the possibility that the electorate changes, that the situation changes. If you want to do what you want to do is like what Obama did in Iowa. You get a little slingshot, you get a little momentum, Mm -hmm. the electorate starts to change. People start to say, well, maybe I'm looking at this race differently. Maybe I'm looking at it anew. You get a little momentum and see what happens. And I think, Mark, to your point, that 32 days between New Hampshire and South Carolina, if Haley can go into that looking like she is the the number two and she can go into it there, then maybe she gets a race up. And I don't think she gets out. Of, sorry, I know you're supposed to go next. But no, there, there's, think, there's, there's no order here. I don't think she gets out last word, um, if she comes in close seconds in any of this because with all the drama we talked about earlier with him, mm. I mean... Who knows what could happen? Why is he? Why is Donald Trump spending four million dollars in ads in New Hampshire if he's thirty points up or whatever number he's? Well, up that's the thing. He's not thirty because, points up in New Hampshire. Where well, he isn't, but he's twenty. But twenty. But no. the, the bottom line, w- w- ten. But he's still yeah, spending cool. it against <laughs> Nikki Haley. Yeah, cool. Does he want to just kill her off right away so he's got a? clear sailing, or does he believe she's in the fight for the long haul? Why? Because four million in ads is a lot of money. Four million dollars ads is a lot of money in a small state. You do have to buy the Boston media market, which is mm-hmm. expensive, right? Mm-hmm. Iowa's cheap media, uh, New Hampshire to get to the about 80 percent of the Iowa population or the uh, New Hampshire population lives in the uh, Boston mm-hmm. metropolitan uh, TV market. So it is more expensive. But it's also this. If you don't kill off Nikki Haley in New Hampshire, you're going to have to deal with her again and again. And you're going to have to. And and she will have resources. She does have the Coke network. She does have these big donors. The PACs will line up behind her and you'll be dealing with her all the way into Super Tuesday if you don't kill her there. I I think to Chris's point, the Trump campaign the entire time has said we're punching to the next person down. And right now she appears to be the next person down. DeSantis is gone. By the way, did you know that we're trying to go back to the moon? And it could happen here in the next handful of days. Not exactly how you think. The former head of NASA joins us on the other side of the break to explain what is going on. Are you prepared for an emergency or disaster? Because it's not a matter of if, but when. Don't find yourself saying, (laughs) when the storm rolls in, my time to find a pet-friendly evacuation center will have run out. The scorching heat wave will leave me powerless to cool my insulin. I'll face a hurricane without meds. Now that's a tough pill to swallow. Let's prepare so we all have a better story to tell. Get started at ready.gov slash older adults. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Action! When I grow up, I want to be a director. Because they get to talk to everybody about everything. They get to make cool movies and dance music videos. If your child is sick over and over again, it could be PI, a defect of the immune system that affects millions. Early testing can give children a chance to dream. And when I'm a director, I get to say, light, camera, action. For more information, visit the Jeffrey Modell Foundation at infoforpi.org. That's a wrap. (laughs) This is an important message from the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Mining fatalities, accidents, and injuries are preventable. Taking a minute to approach your task safely can protect you and your fellow miners from injury and death. Staying alert and focused can keep you safe. Do it safe. Do it right. Whether buckling a seatbelt or securing equipment, these quick safety measures can prevent injuries and fatalities. Take time. Save lives. For more resources, visit MSHA.gov. Grandpa, look what I got. Wait till you see the bike we got for Jake. It is the coolest thing. Hearing loss happens gradually with age, making it easy to ignore. Yet most older Americans aren't getting their hearing tested. Dad, can you hear me? Untreated hearing loss can keep your loved ones from enjoying what they cherish most. Don't let that happen. Speak up about hearing loss. You'll be glad you did. Brought to you by the American Speech Language Hearing Association. This is Kelly Meyer. Get my podcast, Kelly in the Capital, at NewsNationNow.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, is the media letting Hamas win the propaganda war? Was it the right call for the Harvard president to resign? Plus, USA Boxing's latest policy on transgender boxers. Dan's all-star panel tackles it all. Tonight on Dan Abrams Live. Many Americans have missed regular dental care in the past few years. 
It's important to see a dentist twice a year to identify any problems early. Taking care of your oral health helps overall health. Brushing at least twice a day with fluoride toothpaste and flossing daily can help prevent oral health problems. For more information, visit hrsa.gov slash oral dash health. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Veterans, do you wear glasses or use hearing aids? VA Healthcare may cover both of those for you at no or low cost. You may even be eligible for free dental care at one of VA's more than 200 dental clinics. Sign up at va.gov, call 1-800-MY-VA-411 or visit your nearest VA medical center. Sports allow us to play, learn, and grow. But there's something more important than victory. At the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, we believe every athlete deserves to be safe. Safe from abuse and misconduct on and off the field. We equip athletes, parents, coaches, and others with the right education to recognize, prevent, and respond to harmful behavior. Join the movement to champion respect and end abuse at uscenterforsafesport.org. Children are the greatest joy and our best hope for a better future. Friends, they are the future. But did you know that millions of kids are facing hunger every day? Food is not just food. It's energy, health, confidence, hope, and even love. Yes, love. Thank you! Learn more about how No Kid Hungry is helping end child hunger in America at helpnokidhungry.org. All right, welcome back. So consider this. Right now, we are barely five days into the new year, 113 hours, 43 minutes, to be precise. (laughs) And already this year, this is what we've seen. According to our Owley Bradley, there have already been more than 20,000 encounters with migrants along the southern border since the ball dropped in Times Square. For context, that's more than Madison Square Garden's seating capacity. And when it comes to government spending, this year we have already racked up an additional $82 $82 billion in debt. For context, that is just around the market cap of Airbnb. Chris, I, me- I mentioned these two issues because when you look at the polling, the economy, immigration, they're one and two. And this is where we are to start off the year. You know, I, I am as happy to run down politicians and public servants as anybody else. It's, I enjoy it uh, very much. I, t- I take real pleasure when they deserve it. But we should keep a thought. We should keep a hope for uh, Republican Jim Lankford and uh, of Oklahoma and a bunch of Democrats on the other side who are right now trying to fashion some sort of a deal that will address the border, that will address funding for Ukraine. And by the way, we are coming up on the first of two basically scheduled government shutdowns. Yep. Right here in we, 10 days. You know, the, uh, the adults in the room have to show up because of what you're talking about. Congress is going to have to do its job. And I just really want to say that I appreciate Lankford because of the pressure that's on him inside the Republican Party uh, for being caught doing a deal. But it's time for the adults to show up. These are problems that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, those border numbers are a big deal. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, those debt and deficit numbers are a big deal. It has to be addressed, and it has to be addressed by people who are willing to take some Mick, tell me about Mick, tell me about average U.S. household income, $126,500. That sounds high. Uh, U.S. government borrowing per second, $109,000. Talk to me about the debt. I mean, $80 billion already in 113 hours. Yeah, I think that first number is probably wrong. I can't read it this yeah. far from the, from the team, but that 126 sounds high. But look, the, the issue is this. Is it ever going to change? You get $34 trillion in debt, can Washington change? And it, it just can't. And I know that sounds sort of cynical, but look, they've even changed the language in Washington, D.C. If you spent $100 on a program last year and $102 on a program this year, Washington calls that a cut. I'm not making that up. That, 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 that is a statement of fact. They've spent so much money for so long, they don't know how not to do it. Um, And unless you do something structural, like a balanced budget amendment, 
um, that, that requires them to do it, they are not going to do it. They're simply not capable. Very brief, uh, one of my, my least favorite stories of sitting in the White House. I was in there one time when I was the budget director, and a very high-ranking Republican is in there across the desk from the president talking about my proposals to cut spending. And he said, Mr. President, I really like Mr. Mulvaney. He's a nice budget director, smart guy, but he's not elected. And you are, Mr. President. Let me tell you this. Not a single person in this town has ever lost their job for spending too much money. They have lost their jobs for not spending enough. Keep that in mind. That's the Republican Party. Both parties have done it to us, and I'm not confident about the ability to change. Wow. Unleash the dragon. There That's what go, I'm Mulvaney. talking about. Let yeah, Mulvaney, but, let, let, let Mick be Mick. But, Mick. but Mick, also what's on the table is this economy is booming. We oh, just I don't added know. I went, Hold on. I went we just, <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We just added 216,000 jobs this last month. The, the American people... Regardless of how they feel about the Bidenomics and what have you, they spent $220 billion this holiday season. They may not be feeling it, but they're aggressively spending, and you can't deny that. Where do you put that into the equation? Where do you put that into the equation when we talk about the deficit? We do have a spending problem, (laughs) but America is is spending aggressively as well. So what can government actually tackle effectively then? Is space no longer on the list, or is it? Consider this now. On Monday, the Pittsburgh-based company Astrobotic Technology will attempt to become the first private company to land on the moon. Another company will attempt to send similar technology, a lander, to the moon next month. Now, the companies have received roughly $80 million each from NASA in recent years. Mm -hmm. If successful, it would be the first time the U.S. is back on the moon since the end of the Apollo program back in 19. 72. Come on in, Jim Bradenstein, Bridenstine, uh, former NASA administrator, joining us live. Uh, going back to the moon on, on Monday, I mean, I, I think it'll take some time to get there. Tell me about this. <laughs> yeah, so when I was the NASA administrator, going back to the spending problem, when I was the NASA yeah. administrator, I said, the U.S. government isn't going to purchase, own, and operate hardware to go to the moon anymore. We're going to buy services from commercial companies, and we're going to expect these commercial com- companies to go get customers that are not the U.S. government, driving down the cost and increasing the access to the moon for not just the government, but for commercial companies, international partners, et cetera. We also expect each of those private companies to compete for contracts um, against each other, again, driving down costs and increasing access. So. Multiple providers competing on cost and innovation, driving down costs, getting customers that are not NASA. Uh, this is this is the recipe for success for our ability uh, to sustain the exploration initiatives of our country. So, you know, one of the the, the second mission, uh, I think that would get to the moon, like at the end of February, right? Um, they're going aboard SpaceX. SpaceX. That's Elon well, Musk. They're, uh, they're, uh, yeah. you, they're launching. Sort of- they're all launching on commercial rockets. One is ULA, which is happening this week, or you know, I guess early next week, and the next one um, is uh, is in February, and that's going to be on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Yeah. So that gets to my question, I guess. Um, are, you know, are you comfortable with the private sector in this case, Elon Musk, essentially uh, having the, the the grip? Okay. How so? Why so? It's something we talk about often, well, and I'm, I'm curious to hear. Well, again, we need to drive down costs and we need to increase access. And the only way to do that is to rely on the robust commercial marketplace. That's where innovation takes place. It's it's how we drive down costs. Um, mm-hmm. And and yes, we have seen now for uh, you know many years at this point uh, that commercial markets can do this, and we don't have to have government owned and operated systems. You think they're going to be successful? I mean, I know we all hope, but I, I wonder. You, you're the expert on stuff like this. Do you, do you think they get the mission done? So I want to be really clear, and I don't, I don't want anybody to have their feelings hurt. We designed this program as though it were venture capital. The assumption is NASA is going to put forward money, and they're going to go get capitalized from a whole host of sources that are not NASA. Um, so, so the important point um, in this whole thing is um, we expect that there will be, in fact, some failure. Um, and and okay. what I want to be clear, what I want to be clear about is. That, that is built into this program, and that was built into the program intentionally to ensure that these companies, uh, and failure was not built in, but the, the idea that we want these companies to push the edge of the envelope on innovation yeah. and driving down costs, that's what we're trying to achieve here. Any time with tech and tech like this, failure can be success. 
Um, Absolutely. So we'll see. <coughs> Excuse me, how it all plays out. Jim Bridenstine, thank you, sir. Thank you. I think it's great. I love it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, this, when I look at SpaceX compared to NASA, and I love NASA, don't get me wrong, and I, and I love the administrator. I thought he did a great job. I mean, SpaceX is not afraid to take chances and blow things up to learn. I mean, when you look at the SLS and the Artemis programs, they are billions, if not trillions of dollars over budget, decades behind schedule, because NASA has a mentality of we can't fail. Failure is a way you get your funding cut from Congress. Mm-hmm. Elon, it says, we'll improve it. I've already got the next one under construction in the tent. So these, are not, these are not manned missions yet, right? No, no. this is to no. fly a land. But knowing, that, knowing that the Pittsburgh, that these are Pittsburgh-based operations, I think it raises the possibility that we have to be aware of that the Steelers could claim the moon. <laughs> That if the Steelers oh, can't get into the playoffs, the Ginger's on the moon. moon. It's going to be pierogies <laughs> on the moon. I like where this is going.